When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Whether you're making the same breakfast that you have every day or baking a cake for an extra special day, eggs are a staple in our diets. Eggland's best eggs are nutritionally superior to ordinary eggs, containing six times more vitamin D and double the omega-3s. Not only are they better for you, but Eggland's best eggs taste better too. There's a reason that they're America's number one eggs. Visit egglandsbest.com for additional information and delicious recipes. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that's got a curse that he cannot lift. Here is the captain. It's time to buckle up, buttercup. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are drinking Old Scout Straight Bourbon Whiskey. That's right. We're really stepping it up here in the garage. This is a very rye forward, spicy, and somewhat intense bourbon. Check out Old Scout Straight Bourbon Whiskey. I love the color, and I love the taste. Garage grade, let's go ahead and go with five bottle caps out of five. And let's give some praise and thanks to our good friends right here in the garage helping us out. First up, a big thanks to Molly Wood for sending us some Old Scout straight bourbon whiskey. I think she may have stolen it from her husband there, Captain. So shout out to Molly Wood. And a big shout out to Emily in West Liberty, Kentucky. Next up, a cheers, a double-fisted cheers, that is, to Joe and Bridget listening to True Crime Garage together in Fishers, Indiana. A big We Like Your Chip to Stacy in Santiago, California. Next up, we have a cheers to Amy in Winter Garden, Florida. She thanks us for all of the garage goodness that we are sending out each and every week. And I want to send out a big heavenly cheers to Mike Brinks, a lover of the funky Buddha. Gone way too soon. We pour a little out for you here today, friend. Rest in peace and cheers to everyone who listens to the show. Cheers to everyone who has helped us with the beer fund and with things like the Porchlight Project and all of the other great causes out there on behalf of victims and their families. Thank you for contributing to the beer fund. Yeah, B-W-E-R-R-U-N, Beer Run. We have some new shirts for the ladies. Campfire long sleeve tees. You're going to love them. They are going fast like hotcakes. So check those out at True Crime Garage. And if you need more true crime for your ear balls, check out our bonus show called Off the Record, but only if you're nasty. And you can find a link on our website at truecrimegarage.com. Colonel, that is enough of the business. All right, everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. This week's true crime case takes us to the tiny town of Wampum, Pennsylvania. Our story begins on the morning of Friday, February 20th, 2009. Tree workers are busy working at a cattle farm on Wampum, New Galilee Road. 
They are on day two of a job that consists primarily of cutting down trees and splitting and stacking for firewood. Around 9.40 a.m., one of the workers spotted a little girl, maybe four years old, standing in the doorway of the farmhouse. The screen door was open and the girl was crying. Then the little girl shouted to the worker, my mother is dead. The worker stopped what he was doing and told the girl to stay right where she was. He picked up his cell phone and called 911. He reported to emergency services exactly what the child had told him, that her mother was dead. Minutes later, he and the men working with him were assisting by flagging down the responding state police officers. Troopers were on the scene at 10.13 a.m. Two troopers entered the home. They tried to calm the girl as they started to search the home. Almost immediately, they saw what the little girl was talking about. In a downstairs front bedroom, they found a woman lying lifeless on a bed. Under her, there was a large pool of blood. She was clearly dead. And even more horrific, the dead woman appeared to be pregnant. The troopers cleared the scene and quickly ushered in paramedics. They confirmed the officer's suspicions. The woman on the bed had been shot in the back of the head, right where the head and the neck meet. She and her baby were both deceased. This is True Crime Garage, and this is the case of Kenzie Houck and Jordan Brown. Tell me what you think This week we go to the tiny rural town of Wampum in Lawrence County. This is western Pennsylvania, about 40 or so miles northwest of Pittsburgh. On the morning of Friday, February 20th, Chris Brown is at work. He works in the shipping department of a local tableware company called Steel Light. While at work that morning, he receives a phone call from the police. This is around 11 a.m. An officer told Chris, come home something happened. Chris Brown rushed home. When he gets there, he's greeted by a state trooper in the front yard of the property. Officer Jeffrey Martin told Chris that his fiance, 26-year-old Kenzie Houck, was dead from a shotgun blast. And the news got much worse. Chris and Kenzie's son, who was to be born in just a matter of weeks, did not survive. The fetus, a 34 or 35 week old boy, died within minutes due to oxygen deprivation after his mother was killed. Chris collapsed on the ground in the yard. Obviously, he was devastated at this horrific news. He was then taken to the state police barracks where he could be interviewed by police. He told them that Kenzie had been alive and well when he left for work that morning. Police are going to need to find out everything that went on at that house on this morning. They are going to have to figure out who shot this 26-year-old mother, callously cutting short her life and in the process ending the life of her unborn baby, and why. Was she collateral damage, maybe a victim of a house burglary gone wrong, or was she the target all along? Before we go through the events of the murder, let's give a little background information on the family. Yes, a little background information is in order, and we need to introduce the members of this household. As we said, Chris Brown is the man of the house. He and his former partner, Mildred Krause, were the parents of 11-year-old Jordan Brown. When Chris and Mildred split, Chris got custody of Jordan. Chris dated another woman for seven years from 2000 to 2007, and after that relationship, Chris started dating a friend he met years ago in middle school, and this is Kenzie Houck. When they reconnected, Kenzie was working as a hairdresser. Kenzie already had two young daughters of her own. This is four-year-old Adeline and seven-year-old Janessa. Chris and Kenzie got engaged and rented the Wampum Farmhouse together, four months before Kenzie was shot. Chris Brown's son, Jordan, 
lives at the house, as does Kenzie's two daughters, Adeline and Janessa. Jordan, the son, would be 11 at the time. Because of the imminent arrival of the baby, there is going to be some bedroom shuffling that's going on at this house. Jordan's upstairs bedroom was being taken over by the parents, Chris and Kenzie, because it had a smaller room off of it that would serve as a nursery. You want to be close to the baby. Jordan was moving into the downstairs front room bedroom, currently being used by Kenzie and Chris. So we have five people living in the house there, Captain, two little girls, Jordan Brown, who's 11, and then we have Kenzie and Chris, who are now engaged They're going to join forces, join families here, and they're moving upstairs when the baby comes along, and Jordan Brown's going to be switching bedrooms with his father and soon-to-be stepmother. On the day of the shooting, Jordan's clothing and some of his personal items had already been relocated into this downstairs room, although Chris and Kenzie were still using it, and Jordan was still sleeping upstairs at this time. Remember, Kenzie, unfortunately, was killed lying in her bed in the downstairs bedroom, the front bedroom located on the ground level or main level of the home. And Chris said that Kinsey was alive and well when he left for work that morning. Christopher Brown said he left for work at 6.45 a.m. He backed his vehicle out of its parking spot, which is behind the two-story farmhouse. Chris recalled that there was fresh snow on the ground. His vehicle made the only tire tracks down the long driveway to the main road. Chris got to work around 7 a.m. and was there and accounted for all morning until receiving that terrible phone call from the state police at 11 a.m. Seems as though Chris has a solid alibi, but obviously law enforcement will have to check him out. And then the tree workers were at their property that day. Yes, we know that the tree workers were there, and they were there the day before as well. The six workers arrived on this morning at 9.15 a.m. to gather and stack firewood, even though there was a fresh coating of snow on the ground, which was about a quarter inch deep. Now, they parked their three trucks near the woods line in front of the house and got to work when arriving. The workers weren't there too long because one of them spots the crying girl, which was four-year-old Adeline, around 9.40 a.m. This is when the workers call the police. And during this time, Captain, they actually discussed the two sets of small footprints that they could see in the snow dotting the driveway between the house and the road. Troopers Gustafson and Trooper Bowser arrived on scene at 10.13 a.m. They entered the house through the front door. After searching the home, the officers noted that the house had four entrances and that none of them were locked when the police arrived. While the troopers and paramedics were still working on Kenzie to see if they could possibly save her baby, Kenzie's cell phone rang. Trooper Gustafson answered the phone. And it was the school nurse from Mohawk Elementary. The nurse told him that 11-year-old Jordan Brown, who's a fifth grader at this time, was in her office with a stomach ache and he wanted to go home. The trooper told the nurse that you need to keep Jordan there until we can make some kind of arrangements for him. Right. Not telling the nurse exactly what has gone down. Four-year-old Adeline, the youngest daughter and the only other person in the home other than the deceased when the police arrive, was questioned at the house that morning by Trooper Janice Wilson. But she was deemed to be in a state of shock and not able to provide coherent answers. Wilson said in her report that she was able to make out that Adeline woke up that morning, went downstairs, watched cartoons for a while, and ate some food in the kitchen. She said she was up for a while and heard her mom's phone ring and went into her mom's room to look for her. When she saw her mother, she started crying and went to the screen door, seeing the woodcutters working outside, and that's when she shouted at one of the workers that she believed her mother was dead. She also told the officer that she did not see anyone else in the home that morning. And I think it's important to point out that Jordan and Janessa are not there that morning because they took the school bus to school. 
Yes, and one thing I want to hit on here too, Captain, before we move on too far, is for those of you out there that are familiar with this case, many years after the events of that day, this case was on, it was featured on 2020. And Adeline gave a different version of the events of that morning on 2020 than what we just reported here. Now, I want to be completely clear about something. I don't, I'm not trying to accuse Adeline of changing her story. We need to keep in mind she was four years old when this happened. She finds her mother dead. She's got to be in a state of shock. We know that based off of what Trooper Wilson's report says. I want to point out here that we don't have any incorrect information. What we are reporting here is what was in Trooper Wilson's report from that day. And then later we have Adeline giving a more simple, different version in her statement on 2020. So that out of the way before we move along. Now, after Trooper Janice Wilson finished questioning Adeline, now she's going to go to Mohawk Elementary to talk to the two older kids, Jordan Brown and Janessa Hoke. During his interview, Chris Brown told investigators that the family never used the front door, but the state police corporal Andrew Pinnell noted that blood was on the front door frame. The corporal also found a blue blanket on the floor near the front door of the home. He entered it into evidence when he noticed it had a hole in it, which appeared to be consistent with a shotgun blast. Now, consistent with the shotgun blast is very important to our case, as later Dr. James Smith, a forensic pathologist, determined that Kinsey was killed by a single gunshot wound to the back of her neck, and he found the presence of shotgun pellets in and around the entry wound, which was the shape of a large slanted oval. The size and shape of the wound told him that Kinsey was asleep in bed, lying on her left side, when she was shot in the back of the head and neck. To make sure that we don't leave anything out here, the following is a statement from Dr. Smith. Quote, hot gas from the shotgun blast entered the wound through the skin and muscle of the victim's neck and caused the skin to bulge out and rupture near the point of entry. This phenomenon, known as blowback, formed a tract or laceration in the skin. The nature of this type of damage indicated that the gas from the shotgun blast was mostly contained within the entry wound and did not have time to dissipate. This factor, coupled with the presence of powder in the wound and soot around the surface of the skin near the point at which the pellets entered the skin, caused me to conclude that the shotgun was very, very close to or maybe even touching the back of the neck when it was fired. Dr. Smith estimated that the shot was fired from a distance of closer than two inches from Kenzie's neck. Chris Brown, remember, told police that Kenzie was alive and well when he left for work that morning. The cops very quickly confirmed Chris's presence at work all morning, and a swab of his hands detected zero gunshot residue. Chris was basically cleared very early on in this investigation. So our key window of time is getting small and more manageable, right? The shooting took place sometime after Chris Brown left for work at 6.45 a.m. and sometime before Adeline found her and 911 was called around 9.40 a.m. So less than three hours time to work with here. Now, the tree guys arrived at 9.15 and they said that they had not seen or heard anything. To further narrow down the window of time, cops needed to talk to the two older kids, Janessa and Jordan, who were at school that morning. Trooper Janice Wilson arrived at Mohawk Elementary around noon. She found Jordan asleep in the nurse's office, so she started by questioning Janessa. And when they called Janessa to the office, she assumes at first, like most kids would, that she's in trouble. Yeah, the dreaded call. Remember when we were young? I don't know how they do it nowadays, but they would announce your name over the the loudspeaker captain to the office yeah captain to the office and you're like oh no what did i do well she gets to the office and very quickly she realizes that she's not in trouble of course and the officer is going to inform her of that now 
Janessa calmed down and upon questioning, quote, didn't have much to offer about what happened that morning, end quote. That's from Trooper Wilson. Trooper Wilson at that time did not tell Janessa that her mother was dead. We do need to point out something here, too, that is really kind of disappointing. I understand why it didn't happen, but again, it's still disappointing looking back on this case. These interviews so far that we've discussed have not been recorded. There's not a recording of them anywhere. It's simply we have an officer writing down statements and taking notes based off of a meeting. The nurse then took Jordan to meet Trooper Wilson in a conference room. A school guidance counselor was present for this interview, as was for Janessa's. Trooper Wilson later acknowledged, and this is kind of key here when we get into technicalities and the law and, and witness statements and things like that, Trooper Wilson later acknowledged that she had not contacted the father, Chris Brown, for permission to for permission to interview or at least to inform him that he that she was speaking with the children. Now, Trooper Wilson said, quote, at that time, Mr. Chris Brown was possibly a suspect in the incident. And that's why that phone call or notification wasn't made. So while the state claims that the children were free to leave and not answer questions, well, we all know that no seven or 11 year old is going to stand up and march out of a meeting with a police officer and a guidance counselor. It doesn't seem reasonable. Right. Anyway, Jordan told Trooper Wilson that he was awakened that morning at 8 a.m. by Janessa yelling at him after she, in turn, had been awakened by Kenzie just a minute or two before that. Jordan said he went downstairs and got some clothing from the room Kenzie was sleeping in, which, of course, would soon be his room one day, and got dressed in the bathroom. He said Kenzie was awake at this time, but in bed. Then he watched TV with Janessa in the family room, which is adjacent to Kenzie's room on the first floor. He said the only people in the house at that time, to his knowledge, were the three kids and Kenzie, whom he was calling mom by this time. But he never saw Adeline, the little girl, as she was still asleep. His father had already left for work by this point. At some point, he and Janessa heard Kenzie yell to them, that they needed to leave or they would miss the bus. This from Trooper Wilson's report, quote, when I asked what time it was, Jordan Brown stated that they usually leave the house at 812, but since his mom was telling them they needed to go or they were going to be late, he stated that it was probably 813 or 814, end quote. The older kids' bus would come between 8.12 and 8.15 every morning. According to Jordan, Kenzie was awake when they walked out the door. Trooper Wilson asked if he had seen any vehicles at or near the home, and Jordan said that as they left the house through the side door, which is important, remember the father saying earlier that they never used, the family never used the front door. Jordan said that as they left the house through the side door, he noted a large black pickup truck parked by the garage of the home. And he said it was the same kind of truck that was driven by the guy who would come to the farm to feed the cattle. Not the same truck, but the same kind of truck. Right. Then Jordan and Janessa got on the bus and they went to school. I'll just back up a little bit. Kinsey is a mother of two, soon to be a mother of three, one on the way. She's laying down. I would assume that she was asleep. It's almost like she was executed in her sleep. That's what the pathologist would tell us in his report. And basically what I see here, Captain, is a situation where the timeline is very crucial to this case, more so than a lot of other cases out there. And we are really talking about a short window of time here when this murder occurred And then you try to piece, well, who could have been there at that time when the murder took place? That's got to be your suspect or your suspects, right? And so what we have here is a very simple time frame and timeline of Chris Brown leaving for work at 6.45 a.m. If we are to believe Chris Brown, his, 
his soon to be wife is alive and well at that time. It seems like that's probably the situation because later we have the kids saying that she was alive and well later before they leave for school. Right now they're getting on the bus about eight 15 at the very latest. We have tree workers arriving at nine 15 and then by nine 40, we have the littlest kid, four year old Adeline, who's at the door crying and she shouts at one of the workers, my mother is dead. We're talking about a window of three hours when this execution-style murder took place. We also have this unidentified vehicle, so this case has a lot of moving pieces and parts. And every minute counts. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. You can live out your master chef dream. When you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Inside to outside, repairs to renovations. Get started on the Angie app or visit Angie.com today. You can do this when you Angie that. All right, we are back. Cheers to everybody in the front, back to the sides, to the windows, to the walls. And all the unfortunate people in the middle yeah. of it all. Smelling the goodness. Cheers, cheers. Meanwhile, Captain, back at the house around midday on Friday, investigators are still processing the murder scene. Corporal Pinnell searched the upstairs of the home and went into Jordan's bedroom in the front left corner between a dresser and the wall stood six long guns, partially covered by an orange blanket. Parnell began to remove individual guns from this group one at a time, and he handed them to Sergeant Marklinski for him to examine and determine if they were loaded. The first gun removed by Corporal Pinnell was a flintlock rifle, which Sergeant Malinsky examined and noted nothing unusual about it. The second weapon Corporal Pinnell handed to Sergeant Marklinski was a Harrington and Richardson youth model 20-gauge shotgun. Sergeant Marklinski opened the breech of the shotgun and smelled burnt gunpowder in the breech, which he pointed out to the corporal who also smelled the odor. The sergeant also observed gunpowder residue in the breech and in the barrel. So based off of their personal experience with firearms, they both believed that the shotgun was recently fired. However, they could not opine with any degree of scientific certainty exactly 
when the shotgun had been fired, just that it had been fired recently. Yeah, meaning it could have been fired that morning or sometime within that week. Now, in the first floor bedroom where the victim's body was found, Corporal Pinnell noted that the television, which sat on top of an armoire located in the right-hand side of the room, was still turned on. Observing the doors to the armoire were closed, he opened them. Now, inside the armoire, he saw a locked gun safe on the bottom shelf, which was later determined to contain two handguns and ammunition. On the top shelf, Corporal Pinnell saw a work helmet and two boxes of shotgun shells, one opened and one closed. The open box contained 16 unfired federal premium brand 20 gauge shotgun shells. Okay, so... People were trying to figure out why so many guns in this home. We already pointed out this is a a small, tiny rural town. This was, it was common in this area for people to be gun owners and not uncommon for people to be avid hunters. And in fact, we know that Chris Brown and his son, Jordan Brown, they would go hunting together. So Chris Brown owned several guns and one gun was actually owned by his son, Jordan Brown. Well, again, g- going back to the footprints in the snow, we only have two footprints leaving. We don't have other footprints coming into the house. So it makes you almost want to rule out an intruder theory. Yeah, you're starting to see where this case is going here, everyone. We have a situation where, as the captain pointed out, we don't have any signs or evidence that someone came into the home and then killed this young woman. What we do have though is potentially underline that word potentially signs that maybe someone inside of the home shot and killed this poor young woman. Right. But at this moment they can't scientifically prove that. No, all we have is a bunch of guns and ammo and we have guns that are also consistent with the, the weapon that was used to kill her. We have ammo in Kinsey's room, and we have guns in Jordan's room. The shells that were found in Kinsey's room, well, these shells fit into the so-called smoking gun that was found in Jordan's room, the one that the officers both smelled and said, hey, this thing was recently fired. Right. And we also need to remember, too, that Pinnell had already found a blue blanket which had burn marks on it and a hole the size of a quarter. Remember, he found that near the front door. They also found blood on the door frame. Chris Brown acknowledged that the gun found in Jordan's bedroom belonged to Jordan. He said it was a Christmas gift from Chris. Chris said the two enjoyed hunting together, and in fact, Jordan won a turkey shoot competition just six days earlier on Valentine's Day, even beating out some of the adults. Chris adamantly denied that there was any way that Jordan would have shot Kinsey. He said and told the police the boy was excited about the upcoming wedding, and he was excited about the new baby brother. Well, basically what that statement to me, the, the way my brain reads that statement, is that, that Jordan wouldn't kill her, but that doesn't mean that he didn't kill her by accident. Well, and of course, after finding these guns and finding the ammunition, we're going to have to have a second round of interviews with everybody that was in that household. Specifically, they wanted to re-interview Jordan. So they went to the home of his grandmother. This is where he was staying since she had picked him up from school that day. Chris Brown was there as well. This is about 10 p.m. At this point, Jordan has yet to be told that Kenzie was murdered. So Chris sat down with him at this point and broke the news that something bad had happened and she was in heaven. Right. Jordan became emotional and started crying at this news. According to him, he cried throughout this short interview, uh, the interview again with Trooper Wilson. Now, from the record, quote, Trooper Wilson asked Jordan for more details about the black truck and when he had first seen it. Jordan recalled that he first saw the truck as he exited the house when he reached in his pocket to see if he had ice cream money for school. And in the process, he dislodged a mass of fuzz from his pocket, which fell to the ground. 
He said he bent over to pick it up, and that is when he noticed the truck parked by the garage. Trooper Wilson asked Jordan if Janessa had possibly seen the truck as well, to which Jordan replies that he mentioned it to her, but she didn't respond. And he believed that she was at this point too far ahead of him to hear. Jordan also informed Trooper Wilson that he had seen a person in a white hat ducking over inside of the truck. Trooper Wilson inquired of Jordan why he had not mentioned that when she talked with him that morning. He then explained, well, he first glanced at the truck. He didn't see anybody. Jordan also recounted his observation that the lights were on inside of the truck. And when Trooper Wilson stated that he did not tell her that during their first interview, Jordan, after hesitating, these are her words, after he hesitated, then described the lights as being sort of half on, which I'm not certain what that means. Right. After acknowledging that he owned a 20 gauge shotgun, Trooper Wilson asked Jordan if he had fired the gun that morning, to which he answered no. So let's unpack that a little bit. Basically, in this report and in this second interview, we have one major thing that has changed, right? Yeah, he saw a person. Well, we got to frame this with Jordan's 11 years old. And that's what I want to really hone in on, because when I said that one major thing has changed here, I didn't mean that Jordan's story has changed. What I'm pointing out is, according to the adults in the room, at this point, we're being told that Jordan was just told seconds before this interview that his soon to be stepmother was killed that day, murdered that day, and she's now in heaven. That's the major thing that has changed between when he was first interviewed earlier that day around noon at school and now at 10 p.m. at his grandparents' house. That's a major change, right? When you're asking me about my morning, well, the events of my morning don't seem so important. And then you tell me, oh, my soon-to-be stepmother was murdered inside of our home. Guess what? Now the events of my morning seem to be much more important. And maybe I'm telling you some more details because you've now told me something different, right? You're questioning me why I'm telling you something different. You just told me something majorly different from the first time we sat down. Yeah, again, if he was 30 years old and he mentioned the truck before and then started adding details, you would question if he's misremembering or if he's lying to protect himself or maybe maybe to protect somebody else. But he's 11 years old, so then you have to start questioning the detectives. Not saying that they're bad, but what questions did you ask differently the second time around? Yeah, they may not be bad. I actually think they're probably pretty good at their job. The problem here is they seem to lack a certain thoroughness to the job, right? This is where I really am disappointed that the interviews are not recorded because by this point, it is clear to me that Trooper Wilson, along with the other troopers, have already decided that 11-year-old Jordan Brown is on their suspect list. This is why we're having this second interview, and this is why in the course of that interview, she is asking him specifically if he had fired the gun that we now know that he owns that morning. Right, but you have zero evidence so far that has been presented that day that we know of, of an intruder. So you, you, you start going through the reasonable suspects, and I think you start with the, the husband, right? Mm-hmm. And then you go, well, there that alibi is solid. My issue is with this time frame and, and when when was it that Jordan got to school? And could they narrow down when she was murdered? Is it possible that it was an accidental shooting before he took off to the bus? I mean, I guess it's possible, but we don't have him admitting to anything. And we're only talking about a, a window of... Look, at the, at, the, at the greatest amount of time possible, according to all of these stories, if we are to believe these stories, they're on the bus by 8.15, and by 9.40, somebody's calling the police because a little girl said her mother's dead. So we have less than an hour and a half that take, takes place. 
And then if we're to back that up on the shorter side of it, the tree workers say that they arrive at 915 that morning or around 915 that morning. And they don't see or hear anything strange while they are there working. So now we are down to an hour, a window of, of simply an hour. So either something happened before Jordan Brown left for school that day, or if it happened afterward, he's, he's not responsible because we know he was on the bus and we know he was at school. Another thing that I find interesting and perplexing of this case is when you say tree workers, what kind of equipment are they working with that day? Because if I have my headphones blaring some music and then I have my, my noise cancellating headphones on top of that and I'm just using my like leaf blower, if the neighbor shot his wife, I probably wouldn't hear it. Yeah, that's a good point. And that's something that's difficult to wrap our heads around here because just because they say they didn't see or hear anything strange or unusual doesn't mean that something strange and unusual didn't happen during that time frame. Right. And they were just unaware of it for whatever reason. But here's the other thing I want to point out. Again, I'm going to go back to, I'm curious why we're not recording this interview. Right. Again, you are going to this scene. You're now going to the grandparents' house with the knowledge that a suspect, one of your suspects is an 11 year old boy and you're going to interview him there. It seems to me like you would want to record that interview. And here's the reasons why, right? It's, it's some of the reasons that you already pointed out, captain, why are my answers different? Why is my story different? Well, are your questions the same as they were earlier today? Because if you're now asking me different questions and I wasn't questioned on certain things, I may not have just brought them up magically on my own, especially if I didn't know that anybody was dead and that my morning had any importance on the loss of life. So it's all very confusing to me. And then here we have the trooper giving her opinion when she says that, well, I asked him this question. And after he hesitated, when I asked him why you didn't tell me earlier in the first interview that the light was on inside of the truck, Jordan hesitated and then described the lights as being sort of half on. Well, that's her opinion, and that might go a long way to leading someone to believe that this guy, this kid might be guilty of something, where if it were recorded, we could all view it and give our opinion on it and go, well, yeah, he did hesitate, or maybe she's completely wrong. Again, there's a lot of different things here. What's interesting to me is the things that have changed in his story are not just the, I might have tried to tell my soon-to-be stepsister about the truck. Oh, I did see somebody in the truck and the lights were on. Not only did that change, but also we have the added detail of, well, I checked to see if I had ice cream money and I, this big piece of fuzz fell out of my pocket and I bent down to pick it up. There's multiple things that are changing here. And we say changing, but to me, it could also just be the same story with additional details that were left out for whatever reason the first time. Is there anybody else other than Jordan, other than the 11-year-old son that, that claims to see this black truck? No, there is not. And when Trooper Wilson asked Jordan if he had fired a gun, his gun that morning, and Jordan answered no, at that point is when Chris Brown, the father, stopped the interview. Troopers Wilson and McGraw who was also there, informed him that they believed that Jordan was the one who had murdered Kenzie. Well, obviously, if your 11-year-old son did this, you want to protect him because he, he obviously has some mental issues going on. It's interesting to me that law enforcement jumps to the conclusion right away that if it is Jordan, that it's as simple as he didn't like his stepmom and he murdered her. I think there's another possibility where you have an 11-year-old kid maybe walking around the house with a loaded gun and maybe just goes to poker and then somehow the gun goes off. I think there's an angle here where you, where you have firearms in the possession of a, of a child where you could argue accidental death. Well, we're getting ahead of ourselves here a bit because currently they're not looking for technically a murderer. They're just trying to figure out who shot this woman, regardless of how it went down. Right. And we can get into those details 
as we go. So accident or no accident, murder or no murder, that's not their concern at this point as an investigator. You were simply trying to figure out how, why, and who shot and killed this woman. Jordan won't be the only person that is interviewed again for the second time that night. That same night, troopers re-interviewed Janessa as well. Now, she tells them the same story that she told before about getting up for school around 8, watching TV in the living room, and then leaving for the bus with Jordan. According to Jordan, at police request, Janessa was taken by her grandparents to the police barracks for a third interview that same night. This is at 11.30 p.m. Now, keep in mind the ages. I'm, I'm glad that you pointed out the ages a second ago, Captain, with Jordan. Let's remind everybody the age of Janessa. This is a seven-year-old girl whose mother was just killed that day. She's been up by her own admission by 8 a.m. that morning. This is now 11.30 p.m., and she's being interviewed for the third time by police. According to the Pennsylvania State Police, in the third interview, Janessa started to tell a very different story. She said that she still did not see who shot her mom. She didn't see anyone at all that morning other than Jordan. Jordan, she said, was carrying two guns down the stairs. She asked him what he was doing, and he told her his father asked him to move the guns. This would make some sense to a seven-year-old girl because, remember, they are in the process of switching rooms, and these guns were stored in his room, and he's switching rooms with Kenzie and his father. So she says, according to the story, she asked him why he's carrying the guns down the stairs. He says, my father asked me to move them. A few minutes later, she said that she heard a very loud boom. And then Jordan went back upstairs and then came back down empty handed. She later asked Jordan about the noise, but he would not answer her. Then they walked out to the bus and she saw Jordan chuck something into the snow next to the driveway. These detectives aren't stupid, but it seems on some level that they're acting stupid because Janessa changes her story. Jordan changes his story and we're completely suspect of him. Janessa changes her story and well, we don't bat an eye. If I were to have to make an argument for these children, and I guess I don't have to, but I will right here. My argument would be completely different than that. Janessa's story absolutely changes. To me, there's a chance that Jordan's story is the same story, just with additional details. I agree. So it's it's very bizarre to me that they're treating two children very differently. Again, I cannot emphasize enough, and I know everybody in their cars listening or are sick of hearing me say this, but I well, really wish that these sick of hearing you talk. These interviews with children should be recorded. Yes. Now, per several of the officers' statements regarding Janessa's statements about seeing Jordan carrying the guns and possibly a gun covered by a blanket and then hearing a loud boom and then seeing Jordan later throwing something onto the ground, chucking something as they're running out to the bus, these statements absolutely led to what happened next, and that was 11-year-old Jordan Brown being arrested for the death of Kenzie Houck. Jordan's inconsistent statements to police about the truck he saw that morning, of course, were problematic for Jordan. Whether or not the lights were on in the truck and the changing his story to seeing a man inside wearing a hat in the second interview, these are, of course, nails in the coffin. I wonder something here, Captain, about what the boy said about the lights being sort of half on. And this just occurred to me, you know, in, in your vehicle, you have the ability to turn the overhead lights on and you can hit one or two. I wonder if that's what he meant by that statement, that it was kind of a dim light and he suspected that only one light was on in the truck. If in fact he did even see a truck. Now the gun in his room that quote smelled as though it had been fired recently, this is and Janessa's statements basically give police what they were looking for, and that is probable cause. Jordan Brown was arrested at 3 a.m. Saturday morning for the murder of Kenzie Houck and his unborn half-brother. 
He was taken to Lawrence County Jail where he was kept in isolation away from the other inmates for obvious reasons. Right. They are adult men, and this is a little boy. Guards checked on him every 15 minutes. At dawn on Saturday morning, state police resumed their investigation at the Wampum Farmhouse. This time, their focus was on the exterior of the home. They performed grid searches of the property. During these searches, they found a shotgun shell that was clearly weathered. It was rusted and had evidently been outside for quite a long time. So this won't be of any use to them in this investigation. But then the officers walked further down the driveway in the direction of the road to where they discovered a second spent shell. This shell, a Federal Number no. 6 brand 20 gauge, was found approximately 100 feet away from the house on the left-hand side of the driveway at the beginning of a fence line that ran the entire length of the left side of the driveway. The spent shell was located near the base of the wire fence, a few feet from the middle of the driveway, and it was lying underneath leaves which were frozen and covered by ice and snow. This shell was not rusted like the other one they recovered when asked, a state police sergeant characterized this shell as, quote, pristine. Well, I can tell you why they did the grid search, because of Janessa's story. When, it, you, when, you, when she says that she saw Jordan throw something, that's what they were looking for. That's something. Now, is this bullet casing that? Possibly. You're exactly right, Captain. This shell casing was consistent with the open box of ammo that was found in the armoire in Kinsey's room and was suitable for use in Jordan's youth model 20-gauge shotgun. A lot of little pieces stacking up against Jordan. Now, the burning question here, Captain, is Jordan is a little boy. So why wasn't he sent to a juvenile facility? Well, the answer is that in Pennsylvania, the law required that any child age 10 and older accused of a homicide to be charged as an adult because the criminal courts handled homicide cases in the Commonwealth. Since he was technically a juvenile, he was not eligible for the death penalty. But if found guilty by the criminal tribunal, he would receive a mandatory sentence of life without parole. And at just 11 years old, he would be the youngest American ever to receive that sentence. This reminds me a little bit of our Eddie O'Brien case that we covered not terribly long ago, the Trail of Blood episodes number 416 and 417 on your True Crime Garage radio dial. Chris Brown, reeling over the murder of his fiance and unborn child, now needed help for his son. So at 6.30 a.m. on February 21st, he was recommended to two local attorneys. This is Dennis Alesco and Dave Acker, who immediately went to work trying to get the case transferred to juvenile court and to possibly arrange for a bond so that Jordan could return home to his father rather than staying in the adult county jail. But in Pennsylvania, most homicide defendants are not allowed out on bond pending trial. And so Jordan wasn't either. But keeping Jordan at the adult jail wasn't going to work. Lawrence County District Attorney John Bongvego was in charge of prosecuting the case and had three young boys of his own. And he told the Post-Gazette newspaper, quote, yeah, it's enough to make me throw up. I'm not necessarily sure I want him sitting in jail while we figure all this out, end quote. The Lawrence County Jail Warden agreed. He told the Post-Gazette that he stands ready to go on record as saying the 10-foot by 10-foot jail cell is definitely not the right place for Jordan. Quote, I've got to keep him in isolation. He has to be checked on constantly, but he's also got the right to be able to get out for a bit. He's got the right to a shower. It's really tough, the warden said. The price tag for the constant security needed to ensure Jordan's safety at the jail was estimated to be about $4,500 a week. Jordan was eventually moved to a juvenile facility on February 27th, 
and then to the Edmund L. Thomas Adolescent Detention Center in Erie, Pennsylvania, on March 2nd, where he stayed for the next several years. So much more to get to. We want to hear from you. Check out our blog at truecrimegarage.com. And Colonel, until tomorrow, be good, be kind, and don't litter. You can live out your master chef dream when you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that.